Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about everything and anything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, intuitive counselor, and above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on the quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What is life all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. So sit back, relax, and enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. If you follow my work and are familiar with the concept of quantum living that I teach, you know that it is a cutting-edge approach to self-empowerment and greater control of our life at the intersection of science and spirituality, as it reveals the universal principles of how life really works. You understand that it draws on the esoteric knowledge validated by quantum physics that everything is energy, including our thoughts and emotions, and so we are creating our reality at every moment with our cognitive and emotional states. That's the most important principle which drives everything else. Now, what immediately stands out in this definition is the connection with psychology. In fact, my quantum living methodology draws heavily on the neurolinguistic programming, or NLP, which is pretty much all about human psychology, in particular communication and the unconscious mind. So the science part of this amazing intersection with spirituality is not just quantum physics, but also, and very much so, psychology. My extensive two-year life coaching training I did many years ago included several modules from the psychology degree courses focused on counseling, which were very helpful in my quantum coaching work with my clients. The bottom line is, I love psychology and see it as equally important as quantum physics in my quest to find out how life really works. Not surprisingly, when I came across a doctor in psychology talking about spiritual science, I decided to invite him to appear on my show. My special guest today is Dr. Steve Taylor. Steve Taylor, PhD, is a senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Beckett University in Manchester, England. He is the author of 14 books on psychology and spirituality, which have been published in 20 languages. He regularly appears in the media in the UK, including on Radio 4's The Moral Maze, BBC Breakfast, BBC World TV, Radio 5 Live and Talk Radio. He also writes blog articles for Scientific American and for Psychology Today. And on top of all that, Steve writes poetry and has published three books with his poems. And now he joins me from Manchester. Hello, Steve. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Hi. Yeah, it's great to be with you. Thank you. Lovely. You have such a rich background and scope of contribution to the field of psychology and its nexus with spirituality that, to be honest, I wasn't sure what to focus on (laughs) or where to start our conversation In the end, I've decided to focus on your most recent book, Extraordinary Awakenings, with a tale-tailing subtitle, When Trauma Leads to Transformation. And of course, we will cover as many attendant topics as we possibly can. You are a 
prolific writer with 14 published books under your belt, countless articles, essays, and poems. And of course, you are also a university lecturer who doesn't stay within the walls of his lecture theater, but generously shares his knowledge and insights with others through talks, videos, and presentations. So we have plenty to talk about. And in fact, I would like to draw on some of that material as well. Mm -hmm. To set the scene to our conversation, could you please share with us your personal story that has led you to this point of amalgamating spirituality and psychology? It, it probably began when I was a teenager, maybe 16 or 17 years old. And at that time, I was quite depressed. I was, um, you know, kind of alienated and confused, like a lot of uh, young people. But um, every so often, I'd have these ecstatic experiences, which I didn't really understand. Usually when I was walking uh, in natural surroundings, maybe walking through the park or walking through my school fields, I suddenly feel a sense of connection to my surroundings and a feeling that everything around me was alive and incredibly beautiful. Everything seemed to be interconnected and part of a, a greater harmony. And I felt I felt connected and part, part of that harmony. So I didn't understand those experiences at the time. Um, but years later, I realized that they were spiritual experiences or mystical experiences. In fact, until, until the age of 21 or 22, I didn't know anything about spirituality. And therefore, I didn't understand my own experiences. But then I discovered a book about mysticism, about mystical experiences. And I recognized my own experiences. I thought, wow, I'm, I'm not crazy after all. <laughs> you know, these experiences are, are quite common. Uh, so then, you know, that that brought me into the world of spirituality. And I got involved in psychology because I wanted to understand these experiences from a, a psychological point of view. I wanted to understand what's going on in the, the human mind or the, the human spirit, which enables these experiences to, to occur. Okay. Thank you for sharing. You have a number of presentations posted on YouTube, and I especially liked the lecture titled Spiritual Science which is a model you propose as an intermediary, so to speak, between science and spirituality, not religion, <laughs> or as an alternative model converging the two. So I'd like to explore this topic a bit. What is spiritual science in your view and why science needs spirituality to make sense of the world? I don't have um, anything against science. In fact, I love science. You know, Like, like you, I love quantum physics, I love, uh, you know, astronomy. I love biology. I love, I, you know, science is a way of revealing the wonders of the the universe to us and the wonders of the the human body and you know the whole of the cosmos. But the, the thing I do have a problem with it is what I would call scientism, which is a, a kind of worldview or belief system which is associated with science. And there are loads of assumptions in science. It's the, the assumption is that human beings are basically biological machines. That consciousness is just a product of the brain. So it's a kind of a very materialistic worldview, which a lot of scientists unthinkingly absorb. You know, they think it is, you know, it, it is truth. It's the way things are. A bit like the way the religious people think that they have the truth and mm -hmm. they don't realize that they've just absorbed beliefs and assumptions. Same same with a lot of scientists. They just absorb a lot of assumptions about reality yeah. and think it's a truth. You know, the idea that only the physical is real. You know, there's no such thing as spirit or soul or even mind you know mind doesn't really exist because mind is just a product of the brain everything is purely physical so that's what i call scientism and the problem with scientism is that it doesn't actually explain the world very well there are loads of things which don't make any sense in terms of scientism or physicalism or materialism for example you can't actually explain consciousness in terms of scientism or physicalism consciousness cannot be explained in terms of brain activity same with things like um, you know the the uh, the effect of the mind on the body that you see in the placebo effect or under hypnosis when spontaneous healing takes place. You can't explain that in terms of uh, physicalism mm -hmm. because you know if the mind doesn't really exist, if it's just a kind of shadow of the brain, then it shouldn't be able to have any effect on the body. You know, in the same way that the images on a computer screen should not be able to affect the the hardware or software inside the computer. So, yeah, the, and even things like altruism doesn't make sense in terms of uh, scientism and so on and so forth. There are so many things which don't make mm -hmm. sense. So we have to have like a, a bigger 
view of science. We have to have a bigger kind of science. So my idea is that if you bring spirituality into science, then all of these other things do begin to make sense. If you have that, the, if you base science on the idea that there is a fundamental consciousness in the universe or a fundamental spirit, if you like, which is universal and essential to everything, it pervades everything around us, it pervades our own beings, then things do begin to make sense. Then you can begin to explain consciousness. You can begin to explain altruism and the effect of the mind on the body and so forth. So it's a, it's spirit, what I call spiritual science is a, a bigger kind of science, which is based on the idea that there is a fundamental spirit in the universe. And then things begin to make a lot more sense. How receptive is the scientific community to your model or broadly speaking to expanding science to spirituality? Hmm. <laughs> not not very receptive. <laughs> I mean, some scientists are, are more open-minded than you might think. A lot of scientists don't actually think about the the kind of the the implications of their of their fields. You know, even a lot of physicists, even a lot of quantum physicists don't think about the implications of quantum physics for reality. So a lot of scientists are not really aware of this kind of, uh, you know, metaphysical background. But why is, why is that? What are they afraid of? <laughs> uh, well, we have probably two things. One is that they're, they're just focused on their own little area and don't really consider its implications. And in the same way that maybe somebody, somebody who works for the government in an office somewhere, you know, isn't really aware of the, the government as a whole just they just do their job and don't think about the implications but yeah also you know if you have a a belief system you often absorb it unconsciously and you don't even realize it's there so a lot of scientists don't actually don't actually realize that they have absorbed a belief system mm -hmm. and they would say oh what do you mean you know this is just reality i'm dealing with facts but actually you know there is a subtle belief system which uh, affects the way they they view things and once you have a belief system, you know, it, it gives you a sense of security and certainty. Uh, it gives you a sense of identity. So you don't want to let go of it. You know, you, you cling on to it very tightly. So just like religious people, religious fundamentalist religious people will not let go of their beliefs. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll do all kinds of, mm -hmm. you know, intellectual contortions to hang on to their beliefs in the face of evidence. You don't want to let go of your belief system. Mm. Yes, absolutely. We will talk more about your online courses and uh, the courses or some courses at your un university that you promote. But I would like to mention just one at this point in our conversation, because when I saw this on your website, I I couldn't believe that this course is taught at the university, wow. which is Master of Science in Consciousness, Spirituality and Transpersonal Psychology. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. That's big. That's yeah, really, it's, a, it's a great course. That's big. <laughs> is there a lot of interest in it? Yeah, it's it's actually an online course, so anybody can do it around the world. Wow! And uh, yeah, it's every year it grows. There are more and more students on the course, and we, we've also just started a PhD program, which is growing. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of interest. Hmm. And it also tells me that this particular university is clearly open-minded definitely to even allow this sort of course to be offered that's true yeah it's um you know a lot of universities their main concern is financial so as long as you know a course is popular and attracts <laughs> attracts some money okay. then they don't really not really so concerned <laughs> but i mean obviously you have to go through a lot is it quite it's quite a rigorous procedure to have a course accepted in the first place yeah. So it has to be, you know, it has to be very scientifically grounded and very research based. But yeah, and it, uh, you know, as as long as it fulfills the criteria in terms of uh, you know rigor and uh, scientific grounding, then and, and as long as it makes money, then the universities are happy. <laughs> Absolutely, and at least that's a start. Okay, let's now talk about your book, Extraordinary Awakenings, which is which was just recently published. I understand. 
I'd like to read out the chapters of this book as they capture the key topics you address, and then we will talk about it. Peace in the midst of war, freedom in prison, the greatest loss, waking up to life through death, on the brink of suicide, release from craving, and explaining transformation through turmoil, learning from transformation throughout turmoil. The book includes also an impressive bibliography and further resources. So at the first glance, it appears that its objective is educational. Yet after I've read it, I can definitely say that, well, I can't comment on its objectives, of course, the emotional impact of the book is hope and inspiration, which I would suggest are the key rescue ropes, if you like, we need when drowning in the sea of suffering and despair. What has led you to writing this book? What is the story behind it and the objective? Was hope and inspiration an intended or incidental impact? The book, um, it began with an experience I had about 15 years ago. Um, it was the only time in my life when I've been seriously ill, fortunately, so far. And um, you know, I was in hospital for about three weeks. And there was the, there was one point when the doctors were very worried. They were very worried whether about whether I would survive. And I felt, you know, I had it took me it took me maybe three weeks to recover. And then I left hospital. And I felt so, you know, as as energy began to return to my body and I realized that everything was going to be okay, I was returning to health. I just felt so incredibly grateful. I felt so ecstatic. I remember just sort of wandering around and just thinking, wow, this is amazing. I was looking at trees thinking, wow, they're so beautiful. And looking at the sky and the moon and thinking, wow, everything's so beautiful. And even just to go into shops and speak to people seemed like a, a blessing. So everything seemed like a blessing. I felt so grateful for everything. Most of all for my body. I felt so grateful that my body had recovered. And I was so grateful for the healing powers of my body and, and for the energy. You know, you, you take for you, we take it for granted that we have enough energy to to get by from day to day. But when you're seriously ill and you lose all your energy, then it's so wonderful when the energy returns and you think, "Wow, you know, I can function again. I can do the things I, I want to do. I can live again." And um, you know, so it, it was this real awakening for me. You know, everything just seemed so so blissful and ecstatic. And I realized that there's so much that I take for granted normally. That my, I realized that my life is full of blessings, which I had taken for granted and obviously that faded away after a while but I think it remained I think it's always remained at a kind of lower level I think I've never really lost that sense of gratitude and appreciation so I wanted to investigate similar experiences so I started to ask people and investigate similar experiences for people who'd been diagnosed with cancer uh people who'd um you know uh had a bereavement and which had changed their perspective on reality. And I began to find so many stories about people who'd undergone similar transformations to mine uh, in the midst of psychological turmoil. And that was partly why I went back to I went back to university but shortly after that, a couple of years after that, because partly because I wanted to study these experiences. So I, I, that was when I actually got involved in transpersonal psychology, which is spiritual psychology. I did a a PhD in transpersonal psychology, partly because I wanted to investi investigate these transformational experiences. So I found so many stories of, um, you know, people who've been seriously ill, uh, people who'd been addicted to alcohol or drugs for many, many years and undergone a transformational experience in the midst, of, in the deepest depths of their, of their, you know, desolation. Uh, prisoners who'd undergone transformational experiences after years of incarceration. Um, soldiers who'd undergone transformational experiences due to the the trauma of uh, the battlefield, you know. So I, I collected dozens, if not hundreds, of these experiences. I interviewed many, many people who'd undergone these experiences, and so extraordinary awakenings, you know, is, is based on some of the most inspiring stories which I collected, and you know, I, I'm also investigating why this transformation occurs. Why does it take? you know, a brush with with death or, you know, an, a, a long-term addiction or a long period of depression? Why does it take these experiences to to wake us up? 
what what happens when we wake up? Because that, that's the main thing that people wake up to reality. They wake up to uh, the value of life. They wake up to the reality of life following these experiences. And I, I wanted to investigate what we can learn and what we can apply to our own spiritual development. And yeah, so in terms of hope and inspiration, yeah, the the uh, that was one of one of the main aims of writing the book. I partly wanted to make people realize that, you know, human beings are much more resilient than we realize. You know, when life is proceeding on an even keel, when when our lives are, are kind of running smoothly and comfortably, we don't draw on our, our resources. You know, we don't have to draw on our resources. But when crises occur, uh, or when our lives are thrown into turbulence, then we we have to really dive deep inside ourselves and draw out our inner strength, and and on, almost always we realize that we are much stronger than we realize. We have amazing powers of resilience um, and confidence and competence within us. So looking at this from a spiritual perspective, could we say that we are being given such experiences, traumas, pain, suffering, health issues, etc., specifically to teach us that we are more than our physical body, that we have those additional resources, that we have uh, help and support as you have outlined in your in your book, in fact, in some cases in the spiritual realm, that there is a sense of connection with all that is, that that our life is much bigger than what we can see. Isn't it the purpose of our existence from the spiritual perspective? What do you think? In some ways that's true, but I'm not sure that, you know, I would agree that we're being given these experiences. Um, I think maybe unconsciously mm -hmm. some people draw themselves to these experiences because they they know that they are a source of spiritual growth you know i think some people put themselves through a process of loss or desolation partly because you know they want to undergo transformation and you know that's why some people seem to have a kind of death wish you know they they, they sometimes attract negative experiences they put themselves through crises yeah. and yeah because they know somehow it's not a purely negative thing. They know somehow that they can undergo growth or transformation. I think sometimes that's that's true. That's the case in addiction. You know, people get drawn into severe addiction, and it seems self self destructive. Mm. But maybe unconsciously they know that you know you, you have to let go of things. You have to destroy things. You have to lose things in order to go undergo transformation. Obviously, that's not the only way in which transformation occurs, but it's one way in which transformation occurs. I mean, obviously, spiritual transformation can occur in a much more gradual and harmonious way through through following spiritual practices like meditation or following a, a spiritual path. Yes, absolutely. In fact, when I was reading your book, um, what came up for me is that I intuitively feel that the point of transformation in a traumatic experience that you talk about, which is often described as a state of total peace and happiness and serenity beyond words, is a safety valve that opens where there is no escape, where we are psychologically and emotionally pressed into a corner, if you like, from which the only way out is for us at that point in time is to die. So whether it's a, a PTSD or extreme stress, depression, suicidal thoughts, imprisonment, or even feeling trapped or stuck in life in our daily living, it's like a hidden door in the wall that opens up if we press on it hard enough and long enough, showing us that, yes, we can and will move on. So it's a state of detachment that lifts us above the physical and emotional pain. What are your thoughts on that? That's true. 
yeah that that's true um you know you have to you have to let go of everything everything has to dissolve away for this transformation to occur you know there's no sort of um, halfway point you know it has to be a, a point of complete complete loss you know you can, i think the best way to explain it is in terms of ego dissolution mm-hmm. and that means that you, 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 your normal identity your ego identity has to be broken down it has to dissolve away that can either happen through uh, an intensely stressful experience which is like a, an earthquake or a hurricane breaking you down breaking down the house of your ego so that, that sometimes happens in bereavement you know bereavement is one of the most stressful experiences we can undergo or it can happen in a in a more gradual way through a long process of of loss um so that that often happens to addicts you know they go through many years of you know the ego slowly breaks down over many years of loss you know they lose their they lose their relationships they lose their possessions they lose their sense of self-respect their status and every their, their role in society so eventually that they have nothing left Mm-hmm. They're at a point of of rock bottom, and that's usually when the the transformation occurs. Because, like you say, there's 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 nowhere else for them mm. to go. The only option is for yeah. them to maybe either transform or or maybe die. But you know, in most cases, the transformation occurs at that point. Or a diagnosis of cancer is a good example because when somebody's diagnosed with cancer, potentially they they're going to lose everything. You know, they're losing the their life and everything which constitutes their life so that's a massive shock to somebody uh and it, and it can it, it can break down your normal sense of identity it puts you into a different gives you a completely different perspective on reality a completely different perspective on life most people say that um when they're diagnosed with cancer it could be the first time in their lives that they are aware of the reality of death mm. because most human beings we seem to assume that we are immortal when you when you're diagnosed with cancer, obviously death becomes a reality. Yeah, and that just being aware of the reality of death can be transformational. It can make you realize that life is temporary, fragile, and precious, and it can, it can give you a sense of liberation because you realize that everything in your life, you know, it detaches you from everything in your life. You don't have to depend on possessions, on success, on status. You don't have to care about other people's opinion of you. You don't have to care about your appearance. So it, it liberates you from everything and it can bring about this this transformation. Yes, and I think that this is a really important point uh, that you elaborated on about this detachment and, and breakdown of the ego because that's this is the essence of the transformation that, that happens. So... Thank you for that. So what is transformation through turmoil or TTT that you are um, that you write about in your book? And by transformation, do you mean transformation as a human being through personal growth, resilience as a result of that trauma, or spiritual transformation or both? And could you give us a couple of examples to illustrate that? It's both. Um, in... In psychology, there's a well-known concept called post-traumatic growth, which is very well researched and very widely accepted. And that's simply the idea that whenever we go through trauma, in the long term, we will experience personal growth. We will become more resilient and confident. We will have deeper, stronger relationships. We will have a, a deeper sense of appreciation, a wider sense of perspective. So post post traumatic growth is very common. About according to research, about thirty to forty percent of human beings will will experience it in the aftermath of trauma. Mm-hmm. What I call transformation through turmoil is a more dramatic form of post traumatic growth. It's not just a gradual process. Transformation through turmoil is usually a very sudden and dramatic transformation that people undergo. It's like a you know the transformation of a a butterfly uh, from um from a chrysalis um or like a like a phoenix rising from the ashes it's a very sudden uh transformation and you know it can happen in, in the context of any intense form of trauma 
And, and on, on one on one level, it's an intense psychological change, but it's also a spiritual change because it it shifts people into a higher state of being, a spiritual state of being. Mm -hmm. It's equivalent to a spiritual awakening. So it gives people a you know a new vision of reality. People feel that the world becomes much more real, much more beautiful. People feel a sense of connection to their surroundings. They no longer they no, no no longer feel separate, and they feel a, a sense of well being. You know they feel that they they transcend the worries and concerns that used to preoccupy them. So there's a sense of freedom, yeah, a sense of connection, a sense of appreciation, and a, 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 an awareness of a, a spiritual dimension of reality, which they never um, looked at before. So um, a good example, let, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one of the most um, one of the most inspiring examples uh, I collected was a woman called Eve, who was from Edinburgh in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And she was an alcoholic. She was a heavy drinker for 29 years. And over the course of those 29 years, she went through the process I described earlier when everything slowly faded away everything slowly dissolved away you know people didn't trust her anymore um she she couldn't hold down a job she was unemployed she lost all her money she lost everything she lost her self-respect she lost hope and so at the end of that period she was completely broken down she was homeless living on the streets in edinburgh she was shoplifting and stealing just to to find money to to drink and she tried to stop before, but she couldn't stop. She'd been on courses, and you know, she, but she'd never been able to stop drinking. So she decided that she had no choice. She was going to commit suicide. Um, there was no hope. You know, she physically she was broken down as well. She was so, you know, physically worn out. She could couldn't walk more than a few paces. So she decided to attempt suicide by uh, walking in front of a coach. But luckily, the the, the coach driver swerved and missed her, and. She thought she was going to be arrested. The police were called. She thought she, she thought she was going to be arrested, but uh, the police, the policeman who arrived, was actually a nice guy and said, um, "You know, how did you end up in this situation? Is there, is there somewhere I can take you? Just let me take you somewhere. Is there somewhere I can take you to to give to get some help?" And she said, "Oh, just take me to my parents' house." So she hadn't seen her parents for a long time, and her parents knew that she was an alcoholic. So her mum said to her, "Well, do I have to give you a drink? I suppose I'll have to give you a drink, won't I?" So. Her mum gave her a glass of wine, but then the strange thing happened was that the strange thing that happened was that she couldn't drink the wine. She lifted up the glass but put it down again. She kept lifting up the glass and putting it down again, and then she looked at herself in the mirror, and and she didn't recognise herself. She thought she she'd somehow become a different person, and she'd actually undergone a transformation in the in the process of you know attempting suicide and and coming back to you know uh, and realising that she was going to live. So once the doctor the doctor gave her some uh, medication for withdrawal symptoms, and once she was conscious, fully conscious again, she realised that she was a different person. She'd lost the urge to drink; it just spontaneously faded away in a mysterious way. And she realised that everything around her looked different. Everything looked more more real and alive. And she felt this sense of kind of inner depth and well being that she'd never had before. Wow! And yeah, so slowly she undergo she realised that she'd undergone. A transformation. She she went to some AA meetings, and somebody said to her, "You you sound like you've undergone a spiritual awake a spiritual awakening." And she thought, "What's that? I don't know what that is." And she realized it was true that she had undergone a transformation. <laughs> I mean, it, those, those kind of transformations are not uncommon actually in in um, in alcoholics. In yeah. fact, the founder of AA, a guy called Bill Wilson, he underwent exactly the same experience. You know, when he was close to death from mm -hmm. after years of. Uh, extreme alcoholism yeah so it's 10 years now since since that experience but eve she's still you know, a completely different person she still retains that sense of connection that sense of being a sense of trust and she lives a kind of very altruistic life she's involved in aa so helping other uh, other people with their alcoholism um, beautiful example yeah and another another brief example is a woman um um, a woman called Irene who was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 40 and she was a kind of um, a high-flying professional person 
Uh, I think she was an IT manager. She worked really, really hard. People used to say to her, you know, why are you working so hard? Why don't you just relax and slow down? And she she said she didn't understand what they meant. But anyway, she she, uh, she was in her 40s when she was diagnosed with cancer. And immediately everything changed. She, it was a bit like I described earlier. She was suddenly aware of the reality of death, which she'd never even thought about before. But in the context, you know, she, she underwent a transformation, you know, straight after being diagnosed with cancer. She said that she walked out of the consulting room and everything around her looked beautiful. There was this kind of radiance shining around everything. She looked at trees and thought, wow, they're just so beautiful. She could see the energy vibrating from the trees. And she said that she just felt this immense sense of gratitude that she was alive in that moment. And she felt so grateful for, for the gift of life, even though she'd been told that the gift might be taken away. But luckily, her cancer went into remission. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she retained this, this intensified awareness, this sense of connection and appreciation. And everything about her life changed. She gave up her job and mm-hmm. retrained as a therapist and a, a counsellor. Uh, so a, a lot of people who, a lot of people who want to go this transformation do yeah. um, change professions, yeah. usually to a more altruistic profession. Yes, and maybe her cancer went into remission because of the transformation, on as a result of the transformation, because she has she changed her energy. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, in, in fact, one, one of the um, one of the mysterious findings from my book was that people who want to go this transformation, they do. Um, you know, let go of illnesses and ailments which previously yeah. plagued them. In the same way that they let go of addictions, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for people to to be freed from addictions and also from from physical ailments. Yeah, and that illustrates that yeah, the the power of the mind over the body. Absolutely. And the most beautiful part in the transformation process to me is that we shift from a situation of stress, pressure, being trapped, having no escape into liberation, as you put it so beautifully, because this really speaks to me from being trapped, no escape, no way out. I'm going to die to a complete liberation Mm. and a a part of which is detachment. So I don't really care about this, the other that I used to worry about. I am just grateful that I am alive and, and I've got what I have in my life. Beautiful. So speaking of, of those shifts, you talk in your book about the lessons, the key lessons that we can learn from those shifters, as you call them, people who have undergone uh, this sort of transformation, that we can consciously adopt in our life, in our daily living, without having to wait for a life-changing and transforming trauma necessarily, so that we can that there are some some uh, aspects and approaches that we can embrace. So you're talking about embracing the challenge consciously detaching from the mundane and and the unnecessary parts of life and to contemplate and understand death to stop fearing it. Could you speak to this, to those lessons that we can learn from people who have undergone transformation? It's, um, you know, it's clear that when crises occur in our lives, they always have a transformational potential. Uh, But obviously not everybody who goes through a crisis undergoes transformation. Obviously, not everybody who goes through trauma undergoes transformation. But, you know, the crises do have this potential. So one of the things I was thinking about is you know, how can we harness the transformational potential of traumatic experiences or crises? Um, that was part of the reason why I wanted to think about why do some people undergo transformation, but others don't? Because obviously, most people don't undergo this kind of transformation in response to cancer or addiction or imprisonment or warfare or whatever. So what, what are the qualities which allow this transformation to occur? And so if we if we know those qualities, then we can we can use them, we can adapt them and use them ourselves. So one really important quality I found was to acknowledge and accept your predicament. 
everybody who underwent transformation went through a process of acknowledgement and acceptance, whereas people who didn't acknowledge or accept their predicaments would not undergo transformation. So let's say bereavement is a good example. Bereavement is a it's probably the most common human experience which brings about transformation. Can, we all go through bereavements at multiple times in our lives. Um, so in under but in order to in, in order to experience transformation after bereavement, you have to go through a process of acceptance. So when when a person who's close to you dies, you know, it's it's, it's obviously very, very painful and traumatic. But you have to reach a point where you acknowledge the reality of the predicament. You know, you acknowledge the the, the enormity of the fact that this person is gone. They may not return. You will not have any more contact with them, at least in, in a normal sense. You know, sometimes people do have contact with deceased people, apparently. But, you know, obviously in, in a normal sense, you, you've you lost them. Mm -hmm. So you have to acknowledge the full reality of that. You have to acknowledge that your life is completely different now. And don't take refuge in, you know, diversions or distractions or self-medication. You have to, yeah. you know, avoid those distractions and face up. It's a question of facing up and not just facing up, but also opening and embracing the reality. That's when transformation is more likely to occur. So that's what I recommend, a process of acknowledgement and acceptance in, in the face of any any difficult or critical situation. So in the book, there is a there is a kind of four stage process which I which I guide people through in terms of acceptance and acknowledgement. Um, and also an, another another aspect is awareness of mortality, awareness of death, because I found that a lot of people would undergo transformation simply through being intensely aware, being made to be intensely aware of death. Yeah. So soldiers, for example, there are many soldiers. Uh, on the battlefield, you undergo this kind of transformation, or it, it can be a gradual process over over years of being involved in combat situations and losing their their comrades. Um, but being made aware of the reality of death can be transformational for a lot of people. So I suggest that you know in our in our ordinary lives we should be aware of the the reality of death. We should visit cemeteries to remind ourselves. We should contemplate the temporary nature of death. Of, of life um no not not in a morbid sense but it's 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 liberating to be aware of the the reality of death it's transformational mm -hmm. you know it's yeah you know, we have to accept that that death is a natural process you know life is fragile temporary dependent on on all you know dependent on millions of microscopic biological processes and and to be aware of that it's it's liberating you know it frees you from a lot of the the triviality of life Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it frees you from attachment to things like possessions or success. You know, what what is the point in being attached to possessions? What is the point in being, you know, incredibly concerned about being successful or powerful? Because you know, life is temporary and fragile. So that's liberating. It's that's part of a that brings about a process of detachment. And, and, and paradoxically, often when people undergo this transformation, they gain a sense that. That this life is not the only life. They gain a sense that in some way consciousness or their own being may continue in some form. So that's that's yeah, that's another aspect of it. Yeah. I was going to ask about reincarnation. <laughs> Death is not the end. It's just a step onto another existence, you know, depending on, on your belief system. But I tend to think that there is enough evidence so far through NDE, near-death experiences and, and various other sources that our life continues after physical death. I think so. Yeah, I've looked um, in detail at the evidence from, you know, studies of reincarnation, children who recall their previous lives and give very specific details about those lives which are investigated. Um, studies of after-death communications, and also the, the, there have been a, a number of very well, very rigorously controlled scientific experiments with mediums, where mediums have managed to, yeah. you know, um, elicit very specific information about people who've died, which have been very, which has been verified. So, yeah, so there's all that, there's all that kind of evidence, but also, as I said before, when people undergo spiritual awakening, they almost always have a very strong intuition that you know that this life is not the only life that consciousness will continue in some form after the death of the body um and that's my feeling i've, I've always had a, a strong sense that you know 
life consciousness is not just a product of the brain and so when the brain or body stop functioning in this form it doesn't necessarily mean that my consciousness will end or my my identity will cease I mentioned earlier that you are not only a lecturer and writer, author, but also a poet. You write poetry. And because I personally love poetry, I have invited you to share with us one of your poems, perhaps something that relates to our conversation. So I would like to invite you to read one of your poems for us. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll gladly do that. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll read a poem which is re- which is related to what we've just been talking about, acceptance. This is called the the alchemy of acceptance. Yeah, it's about the the miraculous transformation which occurs when we shift into a mode of acceptance. Beautiful. The alchemy of acceptance. Emptiness can be a vacuum. Cold and hostile, dark with danger. Or emptiness can be radiant space, glowing with soft stillness. And the only difference between them is acceptance. A task may seem tedious, a chore to rush through reluctantly. Or a task may seem rewarding, a process to relish with an attentive mind that reveals more richness the more present you become. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Pain may seem unbearable, searing through you from a sharp, concentrated point, so that you have no choice but to resist, to try to escape, to push away the pain. Or pain can be a sensation that you can move toward and merge with, that no longer has a centre, that dissipates through your being, until it becomes soft and numb, no longer pain at all. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Trauma can break you down to nothing, destroy the identity you spent your whole life building up, like an earthquake that leaves you in ruins. Or trauma can transform you, break open new depths and heights of your being, give rise to a greater structure, a miraculous new self. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Life can be frustrating, full of obstacles, with desires for a different life disturbing your mind. Or life can be fulfilling, full of opportunities, with a constant flow of gratitude for the gifts you have. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Beautiful, thank you. It so lovely encapsulates the nature of acceptance mm, by mm. contrasting our life with and without it. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Have you published your poems or do you publish your poems somewhere? Or Yeah, yeah. I, I've uh, I've published three books of poetry. That was from my last book, which was published two years ago, which is called The Clear Light. So I have about, um, I think it's about 60 poems in that book. Right. And obviously I will include in the show notes all the links to your books and to your website uh, and online courses. Speaking of which, I understand that you offer courses through your website and you also promote a couple of degree courses offered by your university. Mm -hmm. Could you please tell us a bit more about it? I have an online video course, which is a recorded course. So there are like five hours of videos with attendant materials and worksheets and poems and exercises mm-hmm. so that's uh, that's available through my website it's called the uh, the calm center video course mm-hmm. um, and at my university we have uh, we have an attendance course um which is called it's a master's degree in in interdisciplinary psychology but also i i teach on an online master's degree which we, we were talking about earlier mm-hmm. that's a degree in consciousness spirituality and transpersonal psychology 
that's through an organization called the LF Trust, which also runs PhDs in similar areas. So if anybody's interested in those courses, they can contact me through my, web my website. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you. And yes, I will include those links. Okay, Steve, uh, is there any final thought or message you would like to leave our audience with? Yeah, I'd like to remind people that, um, you know, when crises and challenges occur in our lives, they do offer the potential for growth and even transformation. So, you know, we, we should look at them as an opportunity for growth. There is always a, a positive side to them, a kind of a, a positive undercurrent which they possess. And at the same time, I'd like to remind people that we are much more resilient than we realize. You know, the, the thing I was struck time and time again when I wrote the book, it struck me that people are just so incredibly resilient. You know, people will go through the most, you know, tortuous and turbulent experiences and come through and overcome these experiences because there is so much mm. strength within us which we don't which we don't normally have access to. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Very well said. Well, Steve, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's been uh, yeah, it's been a lovely conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on Quantum Living. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.